Welcome back to Breakfast with Bob. My name is Bob Babbitt. We are Challenge Penticton. We are based at the Hooded Merganser. This is the Canadian Multisport National Championships, the site of the ITU 2017 World Championships. We'll have six World Championship events over 10 days. And if we're in Canada, we have to talk to the Queen of Canada, <laughs> Melanie McQuaid, four-time uh, off-road triathlon champion. Three Xterras, one Cross triathlon whatever the name is there's so many different names for this sport now yeah and I, I think that's cool you know it's a it's a legitimate discipline now yes so, that's true so I think we can call it all cross triathlon okay and then extra is a brand underneath yeah I yeah, like exactly. that. So exactly. So how you doing? I'm really good. I've had, it's been a tough year. I What'd just, you do to your ankle? What the heck? I don't know. I, I guess or like foot, whatever it was, it was my turn to have the kind of get over an injury adversity that pretty much every multi-sport athlete has experienced. Some point, yeah. And uh, I chalk it up to being pretty sturdy that I've never had a major sort of training related right. overuse injury. Yeah. So instead I decided to rip my foot off my leg. <laughs> <laughs> so, Pretty darn close to that, right? It was. It really was. So it, um, it's been a, a big fat dose of adversity, but um, uh, there's always some positive things that come out of swim better bad stuff, <laughs> right? Oh yeah, exactly. You're like, probably like, oh, I am the best swimmer, mountain biker ever right now. Now, can you ride? Is it oh yeah, no. Actually, to be fair, I, I was able to ride um, uh, three and a half weeks after. Yeah. Not not like well, but right, but, but, able to but I was back on my over, bike yeah. really early. So it's just running. I I actually wasn't able to get back to running till almost July. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So here. Being, uh, you know, for tomorrow, what are the what are the goals for you? Realistically, swim, bike, and then see what happens. Yeah, I, I mean this in the most like the the most positive way. I'm gonna try and figure out how to have an um, Andrew Starkowitz type race. Okay, you know, like I really admire how he really takes the race out hard. He's a great swimmer, and he just smashes the bike, and then sometimes he hangs on for the run, exactly. and sometimes he doesn't. Right. And, um, and so I just look at that in that, I, like, I have to build back my running over time, and uh, I'm going to just start testing my ability to Andrew Starkowitz right. the crap out of races. <laughs> <laughs> I and I, I, Andy, I know you're going through an injury right now. Yes. I think that's uh, I, a bad one as well, and uh, I mean that in the most, like, Absolutely. you know, the best way. <laughs> the legendary yes, go-for-it exactly. type of experience, which we love. We yeah. love people who go for it. That's, yeah. that's always the best. Yeah. And that's, to be honest... That's really what you see in the, the Olympic format. I mean, Alistair yes. Brownlee is a, I yes. am going for it, right? It's yeah. changed from being a swim, cruise around the bike, run. Now yeah. it is a full-on, full-bore the entire time. And I, I think we can see that coming into uh, long course racing, that um, athletes at the top really don't have a weakness anymore. And I think more and more you can't afford to have a poor swim. So it's right. been good for me to actually look at, um, how do I execute a really great open water swim and then get back to some of the bike strength that I used to have? Because right. I think in attempting to be able to run a marathon, I gave up a lot of the power that I had on the bike. And so it's been a real eye opener to me to look back, to start to see the numbers that I was seeing when I was at my best in Xterra yeah. and, and realize, back. oh, I like better than before. Wow. So it, it's, it's. I, I think at this stage in my career, what, what I just want to let everybody out there know yes. is that sometimes we look at d decreasing numbers and think, oh, I'm getting older or, oh, those are behind me. And I think that sometimes you just have to look at how you're training. What was working before and what are you doing now to adapt or change? Like for me, it was sort of adapt my I need my to become a runner. I need to be exactly. get leaner. I need to do fast exactly. twitch stuff. And then you lose your power. Exactly. And so you start to lose your strengths. And yeah. so this was a really great way for me to go back and start to like, look at what made me ride like that before, yes. get back to some of that stuff. And now that I'm reintroducing the running, don't lose it. Don't, don't abandon that kind of training that allowed me to um, have a threshold that, w frankly, it was used to be 50 watts higher than I was riding. Wow. So I was like riding at 100% of my max all the time because I was so You're diesel so engine. Right. Right. And that and I think that especially as we get into the women's race being more and more competitive at the bigger races yes, like 70.3 or like a race like Kona that's coming. You have to be able to react and you have to have if you don't want to ride with that group, you have to be able to ride away. And I think sometimes unless you're a runner and you're just going to sit in that group and wait, which doesn't at this point. What we're saying, I remember talking to Jesse Thomas recently on the yeah. show and he was saying I asked him the biggest change in the last few years is the biggest change is. Everybody has a foot on the accelerator, on the bike from 
first pedal stroke. Mm -hmm. It used to be, it was tactical, mm -hmm. and then the mm -hmm. run, the big cyclist tried to get away, everybody rides hard. Yeah. And then you hope to hang on in the run. Yeah. It's different. Yeah, and I think if you don't train to be able to ride that hard, it's going to hurt you so much more for the run. Absolutely. So you're, you're nobody just settled in. So I think having that... Um, Having that max power and having that cycling ability that used yeah. to define me as a triathlete um, is going to make me a better long course triathlete right. in the end. Right. I'm, ne I'm never going to become the runner in the race. And I think um, getting back to that was really good. And also the, the, the point of whole, all of this and yes. to our audience out yeah, there yeah. is that um, just because I, I turned 40 doesn't mean that the the watts and the power that i rode when i was 30 are no. inaccessible it just the way that i i get to that place is different well and also the recovery is different exactly yeah exactly yeah. and that's what i mean by getting to that place i do the same intervals but maybe instead of two minutes rest i take four right or instead of doing like eight i do six right you know something like that because i don't need that many off in between but you know what? Honestly, I you don't find that's not been an issue for you. No, yet. I find I find the biggest thing is trying to access really high intensity requires more freshness than it did before. Mm. Because I think some of it is mental. Like I used to be better at smashing myself that hard just automatically. Right, and now, right. you know, I have to get psyched up for it. And so maybe another minute is just to get more psyched up for sure. it. Maybe I don't even know if I because I train more hours than I ever did as an Xterra athlete. Now. Way more, yeah. way oh, more. Oh, because you're doing all the, you know, all the yeah. Ironman stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. And I, I think that's probably why I'm okay still doing the kind of. I'm probably a medium high hours Ironman person. Right. No, I'm not. I'm definitely not doing the most, but I'm not doing the least. And I think that the reason I can still do that at this stage in my career is that I was training. I was doing Xterra. I don't actually have the mileage on the body that maybe an Ironman off road might running, yes. off road riding. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Less chance getting hit by cars. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But a lot more chance to wipe yourself out. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so back in the day, you started out you swam in high school. Yes. Swam in high school. Just a tiny bit. Just a tiny bit. Okay. <laughs> but it, it was riding right you were you thinking mountain bike olympics at one point yes yeah, so but yeah, that, that was actually when i was in university okay that, i was in uni i had just started university and i met a guy and he was a trials rider and, and so i went <laughs> always out, a guy it's always a guy yeah and um and so he was just a a really good influence on getting me into the sport of yeah. mountain biking i did this race on hornby island which is okay. like a, a legendary mountain bike mecca if you've never ridden in hornby your your life is not complete so you have to go to hornby to yeah. ride and they used to do this excellent race where everyone camped on tig's farm and it was called hornby bike fest yes and it's it's just as you know green as you can imagine you know green meaning like yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. green, you know, it's that kind of a sort of thing. Um, but it was like, Hornby's just this really cool hippy-dippy island, and yeah. they built these incredible mountain bike trails. And so that sort of, I went there, I did that race, I'd come from a running background, I was trying to, I was trying to walk onto the university cross-country team, yeah. and I smashed myself running, and I was injured, so then I started mountain biking with a guy, and that, so that's the story. And then I won my first race, and so that was like, yeah, that's, I that. won a race, so all of a I'm sudden that here. was, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And so when, you know, 96 is the first Olympic mountain bike, and I think you were even thinking 2000? 96, it was, I just, just I was you were just fresh. brand new, yeah. Yeah, and so, but what was really cool about 96 is that um, because I was fresh and young, I was like that young person that got dragged along with the, with the really established girls like um, Chrissy Redden. Uh, Allison Sider yep. and Leslie Tomlinson. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I had these these mature athletes that had a whole road career behind them. And um, and then they, they had come into mountain biking when it suddenly became a, an, an Olympic sport. Right. And they were all very professional. And so it was really a great opportunity for me to learn from them. But also it was, it was a tough time for me because I was just so at such a different stage in my career right. from them. And I think, uh, I think the only thing I regret of my mountain biking career is that I never learned the patience to catch up. You know, I kind of always... Went off the front. Uh, that. Or I, like I'd always want to do more than them because if I did more than them, then I might catch up. Right. You know, when really maybe I should have let myself develop at a slower pace and kind of look at what was right for me. Because it wasn't actually until I quit mountain biking and then tried to learn to train myself to be a triathlete that I, that I saw... From, from being in the National Center uh -huh. with like Simon Whitfield, that, okay, I, it, 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 it was suddenly obvious to me that it was ridiculous for me to try and run the volume that Simon could run, right? Yeah. Whereas when I was a mountain biker, I thought it was totally real, realistic for me to ride with a 92, uh, like, 
Olympian, Olympian yeah. road cyclist. Yes, and ride hours. exactly what she's doing. Exactly. And she's had 10 years to build up to that. Exactly. And you had an hour and a half. Exactly. <laughs> and, that's, and that's essentially my entire mountain bike career in a nutshell is trying to keep up. Always chasing. Yeah. And, and so when I came to triathlon, I, I turned into a much better triathlete, probably because I was focused more on my own training. So with off-road triathlon, did you know right away when you first did one that, oh my God, this is so perfect for me? Yeah. Well, yeah. Think about it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like you I tried swam, to walk onto the cross country team, and, and yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so I kind of felt like here's this awesome sport that was invent- invented just for just me, just like Dave Scott with yeah, triathlon. Yeah, exactly. Like, I'm, I'm swimming, biking, running every day. Oh wait, they're doing this for nine hours. I'm in. Yes. Yeah. 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 And so I think it, I was just really fortunate to have the exact right fit at the exact right time. Yeah. Yeah. What I always what always intrigues me is rivalries, mm-hmm. right? Dave Scott, Mark Allen, Paul Newby Frazier, Aaron Baker. And especially when it takes the woman's side Mm -hmm. to another level. Mm -hmm. And there was a rivalry between you and Jamie Whitmore. Yes. (laughs) J-Dog. And, you know, a lot of times it's a small pie in our sport. Yeah. So if you don't win, it's like win or go home. You get nothing if you're second. Yeah. There's like no pat on the back, no big dollar. So talk a little bit about that rivalry because I I don't know how many times you guys raced each other, but I'm betting it was a lot. It was all the time. I mean, I think at the at the time for from probably nineteen or not two thousand and two. Yes, I think both of us were just starting to like take our place at the at the top of the sport right till her last year in two thousand seven. Yes, um, I think between us we exchanged wins. It was either first or second for that entire yes era of Xterra. So. Um, so certainly that was, we had a lot, a lot of encounters. Um, our style was a lot different. Like she she was just phenomenal at really quick recovery. She did a lot of races during the year so she could travel and, and, and hit a lot of races and each race that she went to, it would make her fitter. Right. Whereas I had to be a lot more careful. I didn't travel as well. Yep. I didn't race as well at altitude either. So that was another thing Mm. that made up my decision is a lot of the, the, the U S series was at altitude. So I couldn't afford to go to Europe. I would have to prepare for an altitude race, whereas she was really good at altitude. She is lighter and smaller than yes. me. Her power to weight ratio was fabulous. So she was just really good at those those high altitude races, whereas I just had to suffer. <laughs> so um, so in order to, for me to prepare, that's that's kind of what I did. So I, so I sort of focused on a few few races, and I kept mountain biking for quite a long time right. in there. Yeah, yeah. Um, where she did it, she did switch to Xterra and just like smashed it. it all over the world all the time. Could so. you guys be friends during that era? No, and that and that that was we we had a very different style. And Jamie is very intense; like she's very focused. She's a full on all the time athlete, and um, and I think that it was it, she got the best out of herself by sort of making me the me the target and you're the enemy yeah the and, voodoo doll. and that <laughs> and that worked at the time because yeah. the two of us were the two best in the sport no question so and and that's how she got psyched up and so and i always took that as okay i should that's a compliment okay yes. so she's worried about me and and sh- so right she should she, be she right better be worried about me yeah. yeah but i never wanted to be i i never i didn't feel strongly i didn't not like her right you know i i didn't have those feelings of like she's the enemy and i also kind of felt like well i better not just focus on her because i know that there's a lot of other strong other girls coming up, coming up. Yeah. yeah and so i and i also didn't feel like although i wanted to prepare as well as i could for every race because i felt really that it i'm representing myself at these races um i always kind of felt like if i'm if i win this race or i don't win this race it doesn't really matter right because it's it's a race this it's, is it's, for it's fun not, it's not life this isn't yeah. life or death it's it's not like it it shouldn't be everything that defines who i am yes and so it, it, i just didn't have that same sort of i have to hate her because she's going to really affect my life that's could because even if i win or lose this race it really isn't going to affect my life yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not like someone's giving you a million dollars yeah no and and or or that i'm curing cancer or i've solved like a major like life puzzle of any yes. sort it, we do this for fun <clears throat> it's a it's an immense privilege to be able to be a professional athlete and i feel like i have to be more than just winning races to be a good professional athlete and and i feel like there's other things that you do as a pro right. than just win that make you a good pro. Did it help you in training knowing that she was out there? Because, you know, I remember we were interviewing tennis player John McEnroe, and when Bjorn Borg retired, yeah. he felt like a little empty. Yeah. Right? It's yeah. like, oh, even though we raced, he competed with other guys, there was something special about that. 
Yeah. For you, was it, you know, when, when Jamie uh, had the surgery and couldn't race again, was, was that a loss for you? Well, I think it, it sort of ended an era for yeah, sure. Like yeah. it changed the, it definitely changed what the complexion of the sport was like. So she's, she was sorely missed because right. she was a big part of, a big part of the sport. Um, and she and, helped the two of you together elevated the woman's side yeah. of it where a lot of times you know the men's side always gets exposure yeah in this particular case a lot of times you guys were overshadowing the men's side because that rivalry people knew the two of you yeah and i think it's interesting that you like we have that rivalry and that sort of was bigger than the sport itself yeah and that's what it took for people to pay attention to the women racing so sure. like if we look at iron man now um, and we look at these issues around like having like a, the equal numbers 50, and whatever, whatever all that kind of stuff if, if in any other instance, if you took that group of individuals, those women, those lawyers, those medical right. doctors, those like, so they're like in, incredibly smart. Some of, the, some of them are moms. Some of them have like amazing businesses right. on the side. There's this like incredible group of human beings. Right. And in any other instance, everybody would be like, of course they should be treated equally. Of course they should. Right. But somehow in this weird, bizarro world of sports, <laughs> women end up being having to justify their equality. Yeah. And that's what I don't understand is that and that's why I don't actually believe in, in some of the things that are happening to to try and fight for this equality, because I, I think that you, there sh there should already be that earned respect you shouldn't have to we shouldn't to, have to beg for it no, no. it just when and we meaning i don't know if i ever want to go to kona so it's not about me but they i i think that on so many occasions that group of women have earned the respect and i think that it should be more like it's race so directors and the pro men and the the fans and everybody else should be demanding it not right. the women right. I, I think all of the women should just be quiet and go okay you know what we've had it we're not even going to talk about this anymore. This right. is ridiculous. It's beneath the level of human that we are, that we have to now demand for equality. Yes. Right. Well, And it's funny because you look back at the history of triathlon and you look at Valerie Silk and you look at Sharon yes. Ackles and you look at Lynn LaMare, the first woman to do the, to do the race. And really, what put the sport on the map? Julie Moss and Kathleen McCartney. Yeah. You know, the, the crawl. Yeah. So the sport has been built on and built on equal prize money. Yes. Cycling is the worst, but we have always had equal prize money. So to me, there, there shouldn't be a discussion. Of course, you know, if you have 50 guys, it's 50 women. End of story. And uh, hopefully, eventually, you've got uh, 60 and 60 and 70 and 70. And we want more pros out there racing. Yeah. And I mean, that's why I came to, I was so, it was so easy for me to come from mountain biking to triathlon because, uh, of course, the environment is so much better for women's sport in triathlon. Yes. But getting back to the rivalry, I find it interesting that what was so compelling is that people were were enamored by women who have that passion, right? right? That are that competitive, like as if it were be would be surprising. So yes, that that as if this were were something strange or new that women would have that drive and that passion and that and that sort of like, I don't know, like why is that so co compelling? But it is it to is see compelling. to see women. Um, well, rivalry race that hard, yeah, yeah. compete that hard, yeah. and care that much, and and so. And yet, like, while you're one of those women, you're like, well, of course. Well, what did you expect? I train full time to be the best in the world. Of course, I'm going to care. Of course, I'm going to be passionate. And of course, I'm going to want to win. And of course, I'm going to want to win. And of course, I don't really want her to win. But at the same day, I, at the same time, I absolutely respect her ability. And I'm, I'm thankful that I have her to help me to push the level. Because if Jamie and I hadn't had each other to push the level, we wouldn't be ready for the influx of new people to come in. And that, that's the reason we were up at the top for so long, is that we were the ones pushing the edge of the sport. And so that you need that. And what, what's funny about that is that when in the early days like the ancient history with dinosaurs and stuff like that when not everybody had a blog where they blabbed about what they were doing for training you just never knew what no, people were, were it was, doing it was secret you'd have to wait until the season to see what somebody was you up to you don't know what they were up to nobody was sharing no exactly Dave scott wasn't writing this is what i do and mark allen could take notes on it exactly. it's like it was a mystique Right? Totally. He was up there, up in Davis, California. Nobody knew what these guys were yeah, doing. Yeah, and you come into the season, I can't wait to show what I've been doing over the winter, right? Now you have, you know exactly, like, oh, so-and-so is at such-and-such -such to do such-and-such -such training. Or they're, or they're playing games. Or, or they're making they're, yeah. stuff up, making exactly. miles up. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, so. you could essentially coach yourself off the internet right now based on what pros are doing for training, essentially, because yes. they're just telling everything that they're doing. And, and that's... Uh, 
that's weird. That's not what it used to be like. It used to be like you would have to try and figure these things out for yourself. Like I showed up at Arizona last year and I didn't like I'm looking around at everyone's sort of gear choices and I'm like, huh, I didn't think of that. You know, you so I still have to go and <laughs> You're still learning. Things. I'm still learning. So at 40, as, as somebody who, uh, and it's changed, you know, uh, Craig Alexander and Cam Brown and guys are racing and girls are racing yeah. longer and longer. Do you still feel, hey, when I go to a line, I, once your ankle's healthy, I can, I can win. I can beat anybody. Yeah, I, I think w- before this happened, um, last year I went through my year of learning Ironman. And I think you can see it with a lot of girls. When they do their first year of the full distance, they kind of have a bit of a, it's good but not great year. Right, and right. I would, that's how I would dis- describe my year. I was second on my first Ironman. I, ha- I did win a race. And then I, I was kind of like third, fourth yep. at some 70.3s. But my bike speed was off, right? right so not quite where it should it be. It r- wasn't right where it was. And so I looked at some other girls that sort of established their race is similar to mine and and I don't think that's uncommon like when you start to build that Ironman mileage you have a little off year and then you come into your next year and everyone's flying right because you figured it out and so that's what I thought was going to happen this year and uh, that's how I felt and when I talk about numbers and this that and the other everything that I could see from training indicated that I was trending upwards and I think that's sort of how I've made decisions on whether or not I'm still viable as a pro right am I still improving in the aspect of the sport that I'm in. And so I, like I said, I think my numbers for for the bike and things like that are higher than they were years ago. So that's an improvement, right? That's figuring something out being at the stage of my career. And, um, and as long as I'm still improving, then I think there's reason to be here and there's still more to do. And, and certainly I would like to win an Ironman before I retire. So this event was Ironman Canada for years falling out who knows what Mm -hmm. but now it's challenge right Mm -hmm. and it's a unique distance and next year being a canadian gal Mm -hmm. this is canadian national championships this Mm -hmm. year and with four events over five days next year six events over 10 Mm -hmm. days are you excited for what's happening here yeah i think that i i think penticton really is a part of the the triathlon fabric of canada so i i think it's really important to have this quality of race in in Penticton and in Canada yeah. and and I think it's really an amazing opportunity for people to come and see how important triathlon is to Canada mm-hmm. and kind of see our triathlon history right. which is definitely I think there's no there's no debating that the history of triathlon in Canada is in Penticton and I think that we 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 talk a lot about Penticton but really what we mean by Penticton is the people that live in Penticton and the volunteers from sure. Penticton because this town like in order to make a, an event like this happen in a town as small as Penticton, because it's really not that big, right. it requires an immense amount of local commitment. And and at the, I, I think once you come here and you and you see how nice people are, you can ride your bike in town and people aren't running you off the road. <laughs> and it's like there, there's triathletes everywhere. And the, and you know there's this food, wine, and active lifestyle that yeah. is just part of this place. The fabric, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, I think it's a really, as a Canadian, I'm proud to have this be our representation because it, it is kind of a lot of the best things about Canada. Plus, you know, it is Canada, so the hockey, the BC Hockey Hall of Fame is here, so if you want to get away from triathlon. We went to a hockey game the other day, went to see the V's play. <laughs> there you go. Hockey is always happening. Yes. <laughs> I love that. I love that. So how much longer do you want to race? I think I, I I take it like I said. It's, at I'm, time. I'm as much as racing is like subjective and it's in your heart. I'm very objective and um, ruthless in terms of my ability, right? So as I said, my before this happened, my ability was right up there. So um, I'm going to give myself probably another six months yes. to to see how things are going and if I if I can get to where I was before and I'm trending towards an Ironman win, I'll keep racing. And uh, other than that, I mean. I have lots of stuff I'm trying to, I coach a lot of athletes. Yes, yeah. um, Racer and, girl. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I'm, and I'm working a lot with sponsors. Like I, I do a lot of behind the scenes stuff to try and help uh, 
you know, create some interesting, sport. yes, yeah, yeah. and create interesting yep. content that that will draw people into the sport. So I have lots of other projects that I'm doing at the same time, and I think at a certain point we're going to reach the tipping point where the other stuff I'm doing is more important, or I'm I'm affecting more change in that than I am in in racing. But so. you still love it, I can tell. Oh, I like I really I I actually train in Victoria with a, an elite junior squad with Kelly Guest, and so it's really he he's coaching me. And it's also an opportunity for me to shadow a really amazing junior coach and see how he's um, developing this next group of elite next ITU generation. athletes. Yeah. yeah, and it's really fun for me to train alongside them and, and try and offer some patience and perspective to them so that they can, you know, maybe benefit, maybe not do what I did when I was the young athlete yes. and with the older athletes. I'm trying to make sure that. I help them to be patient, to to develop at their own pace, and really, you know, achieve their potential. So it's really like I, I have the opportunity to kind of be the the mentor and the athlete at the same time. And at a certain point, it's going to be more important to be a mentor than an athlete. Love it, Mel. Always a pleasure to catch up with you. Thank You're you. always so much fun. Bob, it's so great to have you here. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been here in years. Again, this is Breakfast with Bob. That is a wrap for today. We are a challenge predicting the big race is tomorrow. Big thank you to the Hooded Merganser for their hospitality this week. We will be at the finish line tomorrow catching interviews with some of our athletes. Until next time, see ya.